Jacob, would you comment on the mindset that is being evinced by Sam Harris in this discussion of why it was a great goddamn good thing that Twitter and Facebook suppressed the Hunter Biden laptop story in the run-up to the 2020 election? So, so my argument is that it was appropriate for Twitter and the heads of big tech and, journal, and the heads of journalistic organizations to feel that they were in the presence of something like a, a once in a lifetime moral emergency, right? Whereas this is not the same thing as not liking George Bush, you know, or not liking John McCain or not liking Mitt Romney for their politics. This was, here's a guy who is capable of anything and we cannot afford to have four more years with this guy, right? And, and, and so, um, so what, what should well-intentioned people do who have a lot of power in these various ways? You know, you're running the New York Times, you're running CNN, you're running Twitter. What should they conspire to do? What do you do with the Hunter Biden laptop story when we already know, we, we know how this played out in 2016 with the Hillary Clinton email you know, press conference. That was the killing blow to her candidacy. It's like a coin toss for me, the Hunter Biden laptop thing, because I, I do understand how corrosive it is for an institution like the, the New York Times to show obvious bias and inconsistency and dishonesty in how they... It's like they couldn't even frame it honestly. It's not like, it, it's not like, it's like the way I would frame it is, uh, listen, I don't care what's in Hunter Biden's life. I mean, Hunter Biden, at that point, Hunter Biden literally could have had, had the corpses of children in his basement. I would not have cared, right? It's like, it's, there's nothing. First of all, it's Hunter Biden, right? It's not, it's like, it's not Joe Biden. But even if Joe, like even the, whatever scope of Joe Biden's corruption is, like if you if we could just go down that rabbit hole endlessly and and understand that he's getting kickbacks from Hunter Biden's deals in Ukraine or wherever else, right, or China, it is infinitesimal compared to the corruption we know Trump is involved in. Yeah. Well, I, listen. I'm thankful, uh, genuinely grateful to Sam Harris for. Um, he just he lines up so many um, corrupt and and fallacious ideas in a row, and I think very usefully. And this is where you know uh, I think he does a real um, public service. There is he usefully shows the interrelation between these various kinds of um, fallacious and and I think destructive thinking. So. To take this from the top, um, here here is a person, Sam Harris, whose whole career and reputation was built on being a sort of human truth optimizer. Right, his whole career was that he was the dispassionate, objective, the 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 one who couldn't be swayed by primitive and atavistic beliefs in God or, or um, you know, an intrinsic uh, moral component in existence. He was above all of those things. And what it means in practical terms to be above all of those things um, is to be precisely the kind of technocratic judge of the good that Harris makes himself here. Now, not everybody, not every atheist takes this as far as Harris does, obviously. But um, I do think that it is not an accident that the that the same Sam Harris, who made his name as the great truth engine, as the, the human truth machine, is now very flippantly saying it doesn't matter what the truth is. What matters is the greater good, which, of course, he is in he is in the position to decide, not the 
American public or voters. No, Sam Harris can tell you. Sam Harris has decided that it doesn't matter what's on Hunter Biden's laptops. It doesn't matter that Twitter and Facebook censored and repressed this. What matters is that he recognizes the grave danger of, of Donald Trump. So here we have a, a very important connection, which is the connection between the kind of underlying, let's call it the the sort of metaphysical layer of the technocratic mind, which he is a supreme representative of on the one hand, and the oligarchic ruling party certainty that it is in the best position to decide whose votes should count, whose votes shouldn't count, what information can be seen, what information can't be seen. Um, I, so I don't think you you should look at this and think, ah, Sam Harris, great truth seeker, Ham, Sam Harris is being a hypocrite here. I don't think it's hypocrisy. I think it's a cop uh, to call that hypocrisy. No, that is a perfectly consistent position for Sam Harris to take. And this is, you know, what what was the Lenin call it? Like the highest form of imperialism. Uh, this is the highest form of technocracy, or the highest form of the technocratic mind. Sam Harris is the supreme representative of the technocratic mind. And you know, it's also worth thinking about if this was true, if Trump was indeed the danger that Sam Harris and others are suggesting he was that justified everything, why did they have to keep lying about him? And I should say there are many, many reasons one could dislike Donald Trump and could strenuously and, um, you know, vociferously object to his presidency. The difference between that kind of political opposition and the ruling party is twofold. One, it's the degree of consensus across the, the ruling class, and it's the use of the federal agencies, the use of the mm -hmm. federal bureaucracy in order to delegitimize an elected president, Donald Trump. And the way that this works, where there is a sort of spontaneously emerging consensus, bottom up on the one hand, which is the cultural consensus among members of the ruling class, nobody needs to tell them yep. Donald Trump is a, is an ogre, is an existential threat. They all feel this viscerally. So there's that element. But that's met at the same time by a top down <laughs> coordinated effort across the agencies. And we see this with the FBI quite plainly. We see this with mm -hmm. the uh, uh, people inside of the FBI who are you know, working on the Trump investigation while exchanging texts about how mm -hmm. they're going to protect democracy by keeping him from getting elected. We see this with the Jim Baker, who was the uh, one of the lead counsels at the FBI, leaving that job to then take a job as the deputy lead counsel at Twitter just in time so that when the Hunter laptop, Hunter Biden laptop uh, story began to emerge, he was in place as the deputy counsel at Twitter so that he could advise the company against, uh, you know, advise the company yeah. to go along with the the the, you know, requests, uh, mandates essentially from the FBI that they not publicize the story. So that's the, that is the ruling party. It is the success of Donald Trump and these putative, uh, populist elements that produces the counter reaction in the first place that leads the ruling party to decide it can no longer tolerate this degree of autonomy and needs to clamp down and effectively take control over the back end of these platforms. They, they don't do it. Uh, they don't do it all at once. They don't simply nationalize the industries as it were. So it's always an incomplete process and there's always a, a space open for um, these now sort of, uh, you know, unofficially um, uh, illegal is too strong, but uh, unofficially blacklisted parties to still find ways to prosper. And there's an argument to be made that the technology tends to benefit them in a kind of structural way. But but this is it's just the, the sequencing is the only the only place where I would disagree with you. So what I what I trace in the in my essay and tablet is a chronology in which first you have the open, even bombastic embrace as, of the internet as a, a 
technology of liberation and democracy by people like Donald, excuse me, not Donald Trump, of course, by people like Hillary Clinton um, and uh, Barack Obama, who are touting the benefits of social media in particular as a force for democratization across right. the world, most famously in the case of uh, the Arab Spring, but also with the protests in Iran. Yep. Um, and it, Clinton is the, the head of the Internet Freedom Agenda at the State Department. You know, one of her aides famously compares uh, social media to Che Guevara as a, this revolutionary force. You know, very telling, like the platitudes <laughs> they come up with here, you know. Um, so so it's these same people, the very same people who then declare the Internet uh, the single greatest threat to democracy. What causes this utterly dramatic 180 where they go from touting yeah. the Internet as a great force of democratization to then declaring that we we need to enforce martial law on the Internet, right. lest civ civilization be destroyed? They perceive it as a threat to their own power and uh, continued mandate to rule. And it's as simple as that. That was Reason's live stream with Jacob Siegel. If you liked it and want to hear the whole thing, go here. If you want to listen to another excerpt, go here and come back every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time for Zach Weismuller and I's Reason live stream.